essay, short <laughs> essay. <laughs> the books. What's that? The books. Yeah. Can you hear me? No. Well, I first heard of Jack Kerouac back in 1938. We were both attending Lowell High School. Now, he was a football star. I was just going there. And his name was all over the sports pages. I didn't know him too well then. I knew who Jack was. He was an athlete. Although we had mutual friends. People like Sam Sampas, who appears in his books, Alexander Panos in The Town and the City, Sabi Savakis in Vanity of Duluaz, other people like Jimmy O'Day, who was Timmy Clancy in Maggie Cassidy, other people like John Cumanzelis, who was John Kazarakis in Maggie Cassidy. Anyway, I really got to know Jack about 20 years later. When Kerouac graduated from Lower High, he disappeared from the consciousness of his native city until he reemerged in 1950 as the author of his first book, The Town and the City. The town, of course, was Lowell, and the city was New York City. But the reviews were enthusiastic, fine reviews, but the public response was something less than bland. Lowell's reaction was somewhere in the middle though the Lowell Sun did serialize the book. But then, once more, Kerouac submerged, and he did not surface again until 1957, when his second book, On the Road, fell on his, the ears of his fellow townsmen and, of course, the rest of the country with the force of a sonic boom. I asked him once what the essential difference was between his first book, The Town and the City, and his second book. Well, he came forth with a smile, a kind of a smile that, to me at any rate, always reflected uh, a broad plane of kindliness, but with a tiny stream of slyness at times. Anyway, in answer to my question, he said, the difference was the money, man, the money. He said the town and the city was written with violin. On the Road was written with bongo drums. Well, a few years went by. In the summer of 1962, after years of absence, Kerouac visited Lowell. In a letter to a friend in Lowell earlier that year, he wrote, I do long to revisit Lowell, but also I'm a bit scared. Every time I cross the Moody Street Bridge, now the Textile Bridge, Every time I cross the bridge, I feel a weight of guilt. But at the same time, Lowell fills me with joy. As I told Charlie Sampas, I revisited in 1954 and hiked around the city 25 miles, recognized all my old chums, but they didn't see me. I was a ghost. And yet now, in 1962, visiting Lowell, he was famous. And the word got around that he was in town. But if Jack expected the key to the city, he was wrong. I found, him, I found him in a local bar on Market Street, and the few that came to see him left with a feeling of amusement, and possibly some of them with a slight sense of disgust. When I saw him, I was startled. I hadn't seen him for years. The once dark-maned, clear-eyed and dimian youth had become somewhat soggy. His face was boost-lined. He was bombed, and he was raucous. He wore a pair of fatigue pants, a plaid shirt, three-quarter shoes, and a hunter's cap. Reminded me sort of the kind of a hat that Admiral Bull Halsey wore on the bridge of his World, World War II ship. What I didn't know then was that all but four or five of my remaining contacts with Jack Kerouac would be under these conditions. That is, he, in a state of alcoholic euphoria, you might say, and I, mostly sober, gathering in every syllable that streamed from his brain. 
But I must say that the booze never diminished his giant mind, and his physical senses rivaled those of Edgar Allan Poe's Roderick Usher. In the bar that night, I was introduced to Kerouac as an English professor. I said, you know, I've long admired your work, Mr. Kerouac. He had been trying to sing with Andy Williams' version of Moon River <laughs> coming out of the jukebox. And when he suddenly saw me, he stopped and he said, are you really a professor? I said, yeah, I am. He bowed Arabic style, salam. When he came up, he said, is it true that professors have the highest rate of masturbation in the professional ranks? <laughs> well, I smiled, probably nervously. I said, I don't know, Jack, has such a survey been made yet? Now, he laughed, and I sat down, and for the next three hours, I managed to utter about 40 words, and Kerouac released about 40,000 of them. He sang, he made speeches, he roiled around the room, the bar room. Occasionally, he would quote poetry. And then he'd look mischievously over at me, presumably for approbation. So I approved. Before I left him that night, I tried to solicit from him a promise to appear in a local radio show, which I and a friend of mine, James T. Curtis, had been conducting for a number of years in Lowell. It was a sunny monthly show on WCAP with a rather pretentious title of Dialogues in Great Books. It was a literary discussion program, we thought. When I put the question to Kerouac to come on our program, he looked at me suspiciously, and I felt that he not only doubted the existence of the program, but he also doubted my claim of being a professor, at least a teacher. I added that we would tape the show, but that we'd have to go to the studio to do it. So he said, I'm leaving in a couple of days. I ain't got time for such pedantic displays. So I said, well, listen, Jack, tomorrow will be fine. Any hour of the day you prefer. He said, you're not kidding me, are you? He said, you know what? You look like a member of the mafia to me. <laughs> so I said, look, Jack, I'm not even Italian. My heritage, I said, is Greek, and you grew up with some Greeks here in Lowell. That alone should reassure you. <laughs> so he chuckled a sodomian joke about Greeks. And, <laughs> and he said, okay, you gray-haired lecher, I'll be up at your one-lung radio station tomorrow at three. And he was, he came. My radio partner, Jim Curtis, and I were disbelievingly overjoyed. He came up there with Stella Sampas, his wife-to-be. And we sat around a table and got ready to tape the program. The sound engineer was off to one side. And just when we were ready to begin, Jack whipped out a pint of booze, took a quick gulp, placed the bottle before him, took a deep breath and said, OK, let's start throwing the crap around. Well, I've heard many literary interviews in my day. And I assumed that ours would follow the general format of, you know, philosophical exchange. So I began with an introductory comment intended to focus the idea Peter. of a milestone having been reached in our program. Peter. Well, I never finished the comment because Kerouac seized on the word milestone. And he said, I am Lewis Milestone. <laughs> And then he went on, he said, milestone, gallstone, death. Well, I didn't know it then, but the pattern for the program had been set. And in the, next, in the course of the next half hour, Kerouac came at us like a thunderstorm, booming wild revelations. And yet in between the gusts and whippings, he would enter passages of quietude leaving us becalmed and awkwardly striving to keep the program going. He reached the peaks of rapture, crashed down to deep chasms of ecstatic melancholia. And as I think on it now, it was a minuscule version of the human emotional spectrum. Curtis and I had difficulty focusing questions. So rapid and capricious was Kerouac's span of attention. I've heard the tape many times. I've come to the conclusion that in that half hour, 
Jack Kerouac was the epitome of Dean Moriarty, chief character in On the Road, with all of the fits, starts, stops, and all the forces that impel Moriarty to try to corner it, to burn, burn, burn. And yet, despite the Kerouacian, Kerouac preferred the word Kerouacian. Despite the Kerouacian storm that howled around us and its constant nipping at the bottle, we did manage to shout out a few questions. We got a few answers. First of all, he was very indignant when he was asked by Jim Curtis about the extent to which he revised his work. Once God moves that hand, he shouted, and you go back and revise, it's a sin. Every time I turn on the faucet in the toilet, uh, no, wait a minute, he said, and the water comes from the river, my thought doesn't have to be improved because I got it from heaven, just like you got yours. Now, as to his approach to writing, he said, I write in vast 18,000 words a night bursts for about a week, and the book is done. I'd use a 16-foot strip of teletype paper and the typewriter, and I'd blast away, single space, saying, I'm going to tell you what happened, because it's all true stories, and all I do is change the names. Kerouac compared his method to that of Honoré de Balzac and his prose to Marcel Proust. He said, I've read Proust's remembrance of things past and decided to do just like he did, but fast. <laughs> To further punctuate his disdain of revision, he said that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet in one night. And then, scooping up his bottle and belting one down, he said that Shakespeare died of drinking in Avon. In the middle of a question that Jim Curtis asked him about Big Sur, Kerouac boomed out that Proust and Joyce are the greatest writers of the 20th century. And he lamented that Joyce died before he was able to write down the sounds of the sea, but that he, Kerouac, would do it for him. The changeable chameleon mood of Kerouac came through vividly at this point. Following his remark on Joyce, he announced that he had finished his latest manuscript. Remember now, this was 1962. And that it would be forthcoming soon. He didn't wait for the question, but he loudly proclaimed its title, Visions of Gerard. Who's Gerard? The question came. The question was devastating. A twilight haze veiled Kerouac's face. But through the veil, we now could see a bewildered little boy striving to find his way out of the sudden darkness. Gerard is my brother, Kerouac said softly. He died when I was nine, when he was nine and I was four at the time. I noted Kerouac's use of the verb is. Gerard is my brother. There was silence as the tape kept spinning on, and Curtis and I looked at each other, and I'm sure that we both felt that a wrong door had been opened. We were relieved, but only for a moment, when Kerouac resumed. He said in a halting, trembling voice, when he was on his deathbed, nine nuns filed into his room and said, Gerard, repeat what you told us about heaven. Kerouac stopped, his jaw slackened. And as he continued, he said, Gerard told them, and he stopped again, a barely perceptible whimper escaping his lips. Once more, silence fell on us, and I thought I could hear the tape mutely turning. I struggled for a transitional idea, and I said, that's a very beautiful thought, Jack, very beautiful. He seemed to revive, though his voice remained subdued. He said, before he died, Gerard told my mother he was going to build her a beautiful white cottage in heaven. The word heaven trembled as Jack uttered it. And again, his eyes betrayed a questioning flash of pain. Suddenly, he bolted, regained his wind-blown, capricious, impetuous voice. He's the one that's doing all this, he said. And by this, Kerouac meant, of course, his novel written and to be written. Kerouac was Gerard, living on, writing, sucking up the wondrous wells of life. Gerard was not dead, he was alive. Kerouac was living proof of that. While we left Gerard and, his, and Kerouac's mystical reincarnation of him, plunged into a discussion of his beat literary buddies. 
Ginsburg, Ferlinghetti, Corso. He praised them all. And he added the name of William S. Burroughs. He couldn't resist the term Rotten Burroughs. <clears throat> he called him a genius. He claimed credit for providing Burroughs with the title of his naked lunch. Then I mentioned this grandiose question about the inspirational sources that motivated Allen to write his best known poem. Kerouac sort of giggled and he said, You know what motivated him? Ash cans and unobtainable dollars. That's what inspired him. Well, before the program ended, we steered Kerouac into the area of faith, God, belief. True, his words on Gerard had shed, had shed some light on this, and now he became more flippant than ever, though I'm convinced his remarks were seriously intended. He used to repeat this a number of times. I see God, he said, in a deistic way, in an agnostic way, in a Jesuitical way. I'm a Jesuit. And then his flippancy was dropped, and he said, I live in a house with my mother. It's a monastery. I'm a monk, and she's a reverend mother. Well, Kerouac left Lowell a few days later, and the ensuing years saw a correspondence between us. He was publishing more books. And then one day, I heard that Kerouac had married Stella Sampas, a Lowell native. He was planning to live in Lowell. And he came. And the first three of the last four years of his life, Jack was to spend in Lowell. Now, why he came back after years of travel, I'm still not sure. He gave me a number of reasons, all poetically vague. The one that I liked best was that he desired to re-enter the womb. <coughs> it's the only place where nobody can get at you, he said. He said, look, you salt and pepperhead old bastard. I'm asked to lecture at Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and other hallowed great seats of learning. Why should I bring my wondrous presence to Lowell Tech? <laughs> I said, Jack, I said, this is your own, your native city. He laughed, made a face. Besides, I went on, Jack, I sign on the road to my classes every year. What could be more ideal than to have the author interpret this classic for them? So he feigned a suspicious look and he said, Jarvis, screw you. <laughs> <clears throat> screw you and your flattery. My book doesn't need anybody to interpret it. It speaks for itself. And so it does, Jack, I said, but think of the impact of your divine presence. <laughs> and he said, ah, oh, yeah, she drawled like W.C. Fields. He liked to do that. There is that to consider. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Boy, Jack, that to everybody, right? Anyway, he didn't give me a definite answer about Lowell Tech, but I was hopeful. I saw Jack at his house about a week later, and he agreed to speak to my students. And we enthusiastically talked about it, and he cackled at the prospect, and he said, you know, Jarvis, I'll juice up your students, we'll all get drunk, and become holy degenerates. Then I said, then I'll get fired, Jack, for corrupting the youth. I'll be put on trial like Socrates was, then I'll have to drink the hemlock, and that'll be the end of that. He said, the only thing we're going to drink will be booze. That stuff will kill you too, he said, prophetically, but it takes longer. As we talk about his imminent Lowell Tech appearance, the idea came to me that possibly he could become a more permanent part of the college's academic activity. I said, Jack, how about applying for a writer-in-residence job? No, I said, I mean it. Here you are, an internationally famous writer, now living in your hometown. You could hold seminars and have the students huddled around your feet, classical style. He says, what do you mean huddled around my feet? What's the matter with them? Are they paralyzed or something? <laughs> so, no, I says, they can sit up sideways any way you want them. <laughs> so then he said, uh, a writer in residence. Hmm, that sounds wildly intellectual, Professor Jarvie. He used to egalicize my name occasionally. I said, all you have to do, Jack, is to give the word. I'll start the ball rolling. I think Lowell Tech would look very kindly on such a prospect. He said, I don't know, Jarvis. I think you're trying to suck me into something. 
And then assuming a, a pose of mock pride, he said, you know, I'm not a meatball professor. I'm a writer, he said. And the twain never shall meet unless it's in a steam bath. <laughs> well, we left it there, but two days later, <laughs> I got a letter from Kerouac. <laughs> All right, think about it. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> a couple of days later, I got a letter from Jack. And the letter was postmarked Lowell. And I thought it was strange that he should write when a telephone, you know, so handy. And the letter said, Dear Charlie, he used to call me Charlie. He said, No, I'm serious about the Lowell Tech writer in residence job. Go right ahead for the second semester, and if it's too late for that, let me know. As I say, I've had similar offers from other colleges around the country, but to these seminars, I could walk over the Moody Street Bridge yet. And after the lecture, I can always brood under the bridge or even jump in the river, the Merrimack River. He said, I can line up the lectures, brochures, because the only experience I've had in teaching literature is teaching it to thousands of kids already informally. You can't learn how to write, but you can certainly learn why literature tells the, the truth of a given time. I've got my hair cut and eyes ready, he said. Yours affectionately, you old bastard, Jack Kerouac. You see, he liked me a lot. Really. <laughs> Then he said, P.S., I can write formal business letters if need be and put in a phony early mercenary initial as witness I-E-E-T-C-J-L-K-C-E-J. -E 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 Who the hell is C-E-J? He writes all this. Anyway, three days before Jack was to lecture to my students, I got a phone call from his wife, Stella. She said, Charles, I must ask you to release Jack from his promise to speak to your class. She was pleading. I knew something had gone wrong. I waited. She went on, she said, Jack has become very upset over this thing. He told me he can't go through with it. Don't ask me why, but he's almost in tears thinking about it. He's been drinking more than ever. I'm afraid he's gonna get very sick. Well, of course, I was disappointed. Cherowak could not bring himself to speak to a group of students at Lowell Tech. Why? I remembered a recurring thought in some of his letters, crossing the Moody Street Bridge, which one has to do to reach Lowell Tech. Every time I cross the Moody Street Bridge, I feel a weight of guilt, he had written in one letter. In his letter about the writer in residence job, he said, to these seminars I could walk over the Moody Street Bridge, yet, and after the lecture I could always boot under the bridge or even jump in the river. The Moody Street Bridge spans the Merrimack River and it's astride the area of Lowell in which Kerouac was born and raised. There's no doubt it was deeply interwoven with Jack's childhood fantasies. In Dr. Sachs, he writes, by moonlight night, I see the mighty Merrimack foaming in a thousand white horses upon the tragic plains below. Jay, of course, read part of that. Dream, wooden sidewalk planks of Moody Street Bridge fall out. I hover in beams over rages of white horses in the roaring low. Moaning onward, armies and cavalries of charging, you planters, you dronicus, king greys, looped, and curly like artists work, and with clay soles, snow, curlicue, rooster, togas in the forefront. I had a terror of those waves, those rocks. Well, thinking about his wife Stella's urgent importunings to me, I wondered if Kerouac had developed a terror of speaking at Lowell Tech, going before his hometown, stripping himself spiritually naked for all of his fellow townsmen to see. He talked about brooding under the bridge or even jumping in the river. If Jack were committing slow suicide by a ceaseless, tragic drinking, maybe he was afraid of speeding up the process of crossing the Moody Street Bridge. The last years of Jack's residency in Lowell saw two more of his novels published, Satori in Paris, Vanity of Duluoise. The first was a thin volume which Kerouac himself characterized as a sentimental genealogical journey. It evolved out of a trip that he made to France some years earlier. I went to Brittany and I went to Normandy, he said expansively, and though I'm not descended from kings, my blood was at the first crusade. I said, you gotta be kidding, Jack. Then he snickered, he says, man, every time I see a Saracen, my blood begins to boil. <laughs> 
Well, Satori in Paris was generally praised by reviewers, but generally ignored by the readers. The same fate was experienced by Vanity of Duluas. Unless the years of arid reader appeal since on the road mountain. If Kerouac were deeply disturbed by this decline, he never directly expressed it, at least in my presence. One is tempted to divide Jack's works into two broad categories, his Lowell novels and his Beat novels. On the Road, The Dharma Bums, Desolation, Angels, Big Sur, The Subterraneans, Visions of Cody, these books scream out Kerouac's ecstasy of search. In this search, he created a new language, a kind of onomatopoetic glossary of pain, an ESP set to words. These novels are really long essays that try to record, without benefit of musical instruments, the true cadence of life. Whether or not a reader of these novels thinks they do is almost irrelevant. Because what is relevant is that Jack offers to those who dare to look some explosive flashes of life's terror. It's true, a character like Dean Moriarty comes through much of the time as a no good bastard maybe, an animal whose only concern is drinking, goofballing, and sleeping with women. Man still regards these activities as a dear portion of his waking moments. Now, if Kerouac's beat psyche reflects volcanic desperation, well, how different really is it from Thoreau and his quiet desperation? They both sweat, but in varying degrees. Kerouac's Lowell novels may be regarded as the other half of his spiritual schizophrenia. Here, he's the romanticist. His characters are seen silhouetted against the twilight sky. They move about with a rugged, honest innocence, and Kerouac seems to weep for them because death will sweep them all away. French, Greeks, Irish, Portuguese, Poles, these are the late immigrants and the sons of immigrants that populate Kerouac's Lowell. If they were crude, hardworking people, Kerouac ennobled them because they were not afraid of life. And yet, in books like Maggie Cassidy, in Dr. Sachs, there is a melancholy background theme suggestive of futility and death. Jack Kerouac was a man at war with himself. If his beat novels shriek for the desire to burn, 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 his Lowell novels lament a lost innocence, an unfulfilled grace. Despite his monumental travels in the world of the id, with side journeys into Zen Buddhism and other credos, Kerouac in the end professed the belief of his childhood saints. In the final analysis, however, it must be said that the two-type Kerouac novel concept must live precariously. His first published novel, The Town and the City, the last one he wrote, Vanity of Duluaz, are deep-throated fugues that sing of a rare figurine, a satyr, one might say, in which the beat artist and the wide-eyed youth were inextricably sculptured together. There was always about Jack Kerouac amid the wild flood of words an unmistakable beat, a rhythm of gentility, a hint of caution, a soft recurring note of concern. Jack Kerouac died in the month of October, autumn's most beloved. I think he always lived in an autumn dream, watching the tree leaves take sad flight. I think it's very fitting to end this with a quotation from On the Road, where in the middle of an avalanche of existence, he comes to a screeching halt and he writes, and for just a moment of time, I had reached the point of ecstasy that I always wanted to reach, which was the complete step across chronological time at the timeless shadows and wonderment in the bleakness of the mortal realm and the sensation of death kicking at my heels to move on with a phantom dogging its own heels and myself hurrying to a plank where all the angels dove off and flew into the holy void of uncreated emptiness, the potent, and inconceivable radiancies shining in bright mind essence, innumerable lotus lands falling open in the magic moth swarm of heaven. I could hear an indescribable seething roar which wasn't in my ear, but everywhere, and had nothing to do with death, with sounds. I realized that I had died and been reborn numberless times, but just didn't remember especially because the transitions from life to death and back to life were so ghostly easy a magical action for not, like falling asleep and waking up a million times, the utter casualness and deep ignorance of it. I realized it was only because of the stability of the intrinsic mind 
that these ripples of birth and death took place like the action of wind on a sheet of pure, serene, mirror-like water. I felt sweet, swinging bliss like a big shot of heroin in the mainline vein, like a gulp of wine late in the afternoon, and it makes you shudder, shudder. My feet tingle. I thought I was going to die the very next moment. Enough said. Thank you very much.